Om Shanti and welcome back to your own channel Seek the Soul that Truth Lies Within. We're going to talk about a very interesting topic today and this relates to the caste system which goes on in India even in villages. Most probably in villages it's more and more practiced as compared to urban cities and sometimes it becomes more and more difficult for people who are practicing caste system to live amongst themselves. So we're going to explore certain nuances of this caste system, what is good and what can be avoided, how it can be understood on a spiritual basis and all the different forms of what we call it as Andhashraddha or let's say it as blindfolded faith in the caste system. We can remove that with the spiritual understanding. So we are going to try to understand the difference between who is a real Brahmin and what does a Shudra actually feel like. Yes, it's a sense of feeling. A person can feel like a Brahmin in a second and a person can feel like a Shudra in a second. We're going to explore all of those things in a bit over here. But we're going to go ahead with a little bit of history about where does this caste system come about. So in the ancient India, when the kingdoms were prevailing in India, not the government system, but the kingdoms, there was a hierarchy system. So even above the king, the Brahmin priest used to be revered and the king also used to bow down in front of them. That means the priest were more important and were the highest ruling class or the guiding class for a kingdom. And then the kings and the warriors were there. And then you had the merchants, the ones who were doing business, who were bringing about more and more of currency and more and more of wealth in the kingdom. And then there were those who were taking care of the infrastructure, the cleaning of the passages, the sewages, cleaning of the whole of the kingdom infrastructure. And they were the ones who were understood to be the low caste people. But then we're going to explore that on the basis of what exactly is this caste system and whom should we look up to to give us a complete understanding of what exactly a caste system actually is. And by the way, this pertains only to the country India because caste system is not followed in Western culture or in any other religious text it's been mentioned other than in the Adi Sanatan, Devi Devta Dharm text which is known as Bhagavad Gita, Rig Veda and other Upanishads. Certain things have been mentioned about the caste system but if you pick up Bible, if you pick up Quran or if you pick up Dhampad, none of the caste systems have been mentioned over there. And we are going to also touch upon an idea and we can find out on our own that which caste do we belong to and how do we uplift ourselves so that we become the highest most divine caste in the whole world. Well, you need not put a caste tag onto your surname along with your surname or you need not tell other people that you belong to certain caste but our character, our way of thinking and our way of acting, moving, talking itself will let us know which caste do we belong to. So let's go ahead with this small write up which I've written over here. I'm going to read out from there and we're going to explore a few more things in between if I've missed out something. So Brahmin versus Shudra. There are actually four sects or clans as per Rig Veda, depending on the type of work they do in the society. <coughs> as we have already mentioned in the beginning, there's a Brahmin clan. There's a Kshatriya clan, there's a Vaishya clan and the Shudra clan. Brahmins are the priests, Kshatriyas are mostly the kings, the courtmen and also the warriors. Vaishyas are the people who are involved in business, bringing about currency or wealth into the kingdom. And Shudras are the ones who are taking care of the different systems which are running the city, the running of the city. And they are the ones who are doing the menial work. But Brahmins were the ones who were keeping the knowledge of the Vedas and Shastras and reciting it to the Kshatriyas. That means the Kshatriya clan or the kings and warrior clan. For them to be guided, 
by the wisdom of the scriptures so brahmins were taking care of that and the kings and the courts men they used to look up to the brahmins for guidance in any kind of situation which used to come in the kingdom now the vaishyas were the next clan of merchants who used to do business and sustain themselves and so some vaishyas were closer to the royal family they could be in the court of the royal family they would be friends with the royal family members and thus used to get the opportunity to listen and meet the brahmin religious during religious ceremonies however shudras were the labor clan who used to do the menial work of cleaning washing etc so as to keep the kingdom or the cities running and clean thus a cobbler a sweeper or a dead body picker etc would do such work they were not allowed to listen to or touch the scriptures or even enter the temples where the brahmins would pray some of them were actually not even allowed to enter the homes of brahmins of the upper classes why because they used to be considered to be doing menial work and used to be considered to be dirty there are more details to it if you read the scriptures of rigveda you'll understand more about it however we are here to straighten out here to straighten out certain things and all the confusion of the classes and see it not through human eyes see we human eyes we'll put people into different caste and creed we'll put people on the basis of the surname into a different caste system and we'll respect somebody more and we might not give respect to the other person but we're going to explore the class of the clan system over here and we're going to explore each clan as per godly dictates not as per our own dictates but as per the godly dictates over here kindly remember that the clan system only works and is believed in country bharat and not for any other country or religion as we have already discussed about it we shall work on removing the biased views on the caste system and also try to see for ourselves at the end if we belong to the highest clan or the lowest we shall be our own self judge instead of putting others in any caste system by judging them let us remember the final judge is not us but is the supreme godhead the supreme creator the supreme godfather so how does he look at the caste systems we're going to touch upon that too so let us begin with the story of ashtavakra which gives us a hint about the definition of a shudra you'll get to know about it and if you're able to catch the catch the essence of the story then you are close to enlightenment about this caste system so let us keep it short and sweet to the point so there was once a holy sage by the name ashtavakra now what does the mean ashtavakra mean it means the one with eight deformities in his body from the neck down to the legs so all the body parts below the neck they were deformed and there were eight different deformities <coughs> now he was responsible for a great spiritual revolution thousands of years ago now this happens this whole setup about ashtavakra happens during the reign of king janaka he was a powerful and a wealthy king and along with that he was a rare king with interest in gaining the purest and the true form of spiritual knowledge none of the kings during his time or most of the kings were only engaged in expanding the kingdom but he was engaged in expanding the the complete understanding of spirituality he believed that once i am spiritually stronger i'll be able to rule over my country in a lawful and a just manner so he used to hold religious debates in his court by inviting various top notch sages spiritual monks gurus who were proficient in scriptures and spiritual knowledge that is how he used to be so keen and he used to try to listen to them the debates would sometimes run for months at a stretch and he would listen to them keenly if anyone would put a tough battle of spiritual reasoning and wisdom he would fill their coffers with wealth and donations he would host all such holy men at his place and give them all the comforts 
because he used to respect them for the knowledge which they were holding. And if someone came out to be very wise amongst them, he would keep him in his court and give him a position as the head priest of the kingdom. However, King Janaka was disappointed and was not attracted by any of their debates for many, many years. And still he was yearning to listen to the truth because he wanted to come more closer to it. And his yearning was becoming more and more deeper for this truth. Now in the same period, in his kingdom, was born a child with eight deformities, as you know the name, Ashtavakra. His father, Kahula, was also a learned sage and used to attend the religious debates at king's court. When Ashtavakra was in his mother's womb, now in spirituality we believe that if you say something when the child is in the mother's womb, if you and your wife are fighting when your wife is pregnant, then that vibration goes to the soul and that soul also imbibes that negative or impure vibration now this is what spirituality teaches us so father kahula would expound various teachings of scriptures and he would speak out thinking as if his child is listening to him in the womb as he himself was a great sage and a scholar one day when he was expounding some knowledge he made a mistake ashtavakra in his mother's womb reacted with a Hmm. To which Kahula, his father, lost his temper and gave him a curse. This curse led Ashtavaka to have eight deformities from neck down. That's why it is said, never curse your loved ones because that curse actually comes back, comes back and bites you. So the father had to live along with the cursed child and take care of him. Well, that's something which we can discuss later on. But more important is, now Ashtavakra had grown up and he followed wherever his father would go because he was also becoming a holy sage. His father took him to King Janaka's court and when the religious scholars brought by him were debating and King Janaka still in the search of the true guru was patiently listening to them, hoping to see the light in the debates. At such time stood up who? Ashtavakra himself. And he stood up in the court and he said, My Lord, my King, you are listening to all the sages, but I don't agree to them. The debates have been going on for a very long time, but I don't find any reasoning or in the sense, or I don't find any wisdom in whatsoever they are saying. When he got up, obviously, all the different sages and holy men who had come from different parts of the kingdom, they started laughing at him. And one of them commented on him. What would this deformed boy teach us about scriptures and holy purposes? And to which Ashtavakra, with his very peaceful, quiet attire and attitude, he just said, My king, my lord, what I can see in this quote is that there aren't any knowledgeful scholars. There aren't any sages over here or holy men. All I can see over here are cobblers and to which all the different holy men and sages, they were burning with rage and fire of anger within. Their faces were turning like copper with anger and King, his eyes were totally, totally huge and they were astounded and they were completely shaken up. And he was just wondering what this young boy has just said. This is something which can be punishable in the court. And at that time, with a pause, Ashtavakra said, My king, what I can see is cobblers. And why would I say that is because they're looking at my skin. They're looking at my deformities. They have the knowledge of all the scriptures. But still, they don't have the third eye of knowledge which would look me beyond my deformities they don't know what kind of a soul am i because they can only see everything and this they decipher every knowledge in this world only with the two physical eyes and the third eye is closed and to this king janaka who had his eyes popping out with so much of anger and rage he mellowed down and he just went into deep thinking 
because he was struck by the lightning sword of knowledge which was the truth which he had been seeking but he was confused because so much of clutter was there in his mind because of so many years of all those debates of all different scholars it was taking him time he just asked the whole court to go shush be quiet because he wanted to think about what ashtavakra just said maybe there was a sign of light over there and he was pondering over it he was completely in deep silence he was thinking deeply and then there was brightness on his face he just stood up he just looked at ashtavakra with his eyes amazed those same popping eyes were now amazed and he had so much of respect for ashtavakra in his eyes at that instant and he asked all the courtiers and all the sages and all the holy men to leave instantly and only for ashtavakra to stay over there even his father was asked to leave for which father kohola was completely in shock he was like what did i bring about what did i do i hope i have not done something wrong and a whole family might be punished by the king and father kohola was also asked to leave and ashtavakra was asked to come closer to the king and in complete deep silence king janaka said please tell me more and that is where the whole journey started and the rest is already mentioned in so many different google pages you can find out about it but the essence of it let's go to that let's not miss out the essence of what the story meant so the essence of the story is if most of you must have understood that those holy sages those people were not able to look through beyond the skin beyond the form of that human body and they were not able to recognize the wisdom or the insight that the soul was living within, the, within that body had so when we look for answers in spirituality or in our life and we distinguish between people on the basis of their physical appearance and their field of work we stop being spiritual and our thinking becomes degraded haven't you ex- actually experienced in your own life when a wife tells her husband i think you don't understand me or when a husband tells her mother tells his uh, or a husband tells his mother or a f- or his father that i don't think my wife understands me what does that mean it means that there's a disconnect between the two souls that means they have been living with each other taking care of their bodily needs but they have stopped actually taking care of each other's spiritual needs they have actually stopped loving each other's mind they have actually stopped loving each other's soul so how do we do that and that is what we learn over here in this small discussion or debate we can to understand that supreme god father he says that anybody who only looks at the physical body and tries to get or gather knowledge only on the physical outer appearance of things as the physical world is showing them through their physical eyes ears and other five senses then those beings are not at all knowledgeable they might call themselves as brahmins but they are actually those same cobblers and a cobbler is somebody who takes care of or works on the skin so since people have said that a cobbler would fall into a shudra class it is not exactly actually a cobbler anybody who thinks only on the basis of bodily aspects distinguishes on the basis of bodily aspects and is not able to touch other soul or is not able to actually understand that the other person or is not able to actually understand what wisdom that soul inside the body holds then that soul is actually a shudra let's go ahead more into deep so here god says even a brahmin who has the knowledge of the scriptures and hasn't learned the knowledge of seeing beyond the skin or the body and hasn't learned to distinguish between the body and the soul is still a shudra buddhi buddhi means intellect such a brahmin is only by name a brahmin so i hope you're getting to it we're going to go more deeper and understand what does this exactly mean <clears throat> then the question comes who is a true brahman a brahman is someone who has a knowledge of the self as a soul somebody who doesn't even look at himself or herself in a mirror and is proud of the way they look 
physically. They, Brahmins, are more concerned about how they are as a soul, as a being, and not as a human being, but more as a being. Also, the knowledge of the Brahma Loka is with them. That means, where we all souls descend from on earth, they have the knowledge of how to go back to that world from where their souls have come from. They can even teach other souls as to learn and begin the journey of returning back home. That means they have the knowledge of liberation or mukti or going back to nirvana. So, which is also known as a soul's final abode or mukti dham or the land of liberation. So they have the knowledge of the Brahma Lok, which is also known as land of liberation or land of nirvana. Moreover, a Brahman would know God and his creation. A Brahman would never say, I don't know God, I don't know where he stays, what does he look like, and how has he created this world. He wouldn't give you those confusing answers. A Brahman would give you complete as it is answers. The secrets of the world and the laws of karma would be known to such a Brahmin also. A Brahmin soul would know the first man, Adam, or also known as Brahma. So Brahma is a word or a name for Adam. And many people in this country, Bharat, don't know about this. They don't even know that Adam was the first creation of God and in the Adi Sanatan culture or the Indian culture, Adam means Brahma. And for the same, we're going to explore more. Then who is Jagdamba and Eve? Not only that, a Brahman soul would also know the number of births Brahma takes because Brahman word comes from the word Brahma. And how God through Brahma creates the first clan of knowledgeable souls. That means, who are those souls, knowledgeable souls? They are Brahman souls. So God through Brahma gives the knowledge of the complete Brahman or the creation of this world through Brahma to the Brahman souls who become foundation of the pure world. Brahman means the child of Adam or Brahma and Adam is the father of humanity. And Brahma is also known as the father of humanity, if you remember. Ask any Brahmin if they know that Adam and Brahma are one and the same soul. Or that Jagat Amba, that means Jagat means world, Amba means mother, and Eve are the same souls. Did you know this? If they know this, then they are true Brahmins. And if they don't know this, then they are. So, a Brahmin is the top knot in this knowledge. That is why a tuft or a hair or a shikha or a choti is kept as a symbol at the back of their head. To add to this, a Brahmin soul follows not just brahmacharya or celibacy because that is just the first step to become a Brahmin. But since a Brahmin is the foundation of all the spiritual knowledge, that's why you see Father Brahma has been shown with so many hands and holding all the scriptures. So, since Brahman is the foundation of all the spiritual knowledge on this earth and the mouth-born creation of Brahma, because Brahma through his mouth is expounding the knowledge and all those who are listening to that knowledge become Brahmins, but not necessary. They are the eldest of all the souls on this earth. That means Brahmins don't belong to either Hindu or Muslim or Christian or any other religion. Brahman means the children of Brahma or Adam. And Brahma is not a Hindu God. Brahma means the first child of God. So since all the religions believe in Adam, they believe in Brahma. So all the religions say that Adam could be a Christian, that Adam could be a Muslim. But God says, Adam was soul conscious being. He had the knowledge of all the religion in the whole world. That's why he was the wisest and the purest of the creation of God. That's why Brahma is the wisest and the purest first creation of God. Through him, God creates the pure world. That's why creation through Brahma has been mentioned. So they hear the knowledge of the creation through the mouth of Brahma and are born through his knowledge. Now, if you ask a Brahmin, are you a mouth-born 
knowledgeable soul of Brahma? Or were you born in a family that's why you are known as a Brahmin? You understand what is the difference? Apart from purity of celibacy, that means Brahmacharya, which with such a foundation of spiritual knowledge, a Brahmin loves each soul. That means first step was celibacy, Brahmacharya. But along with that, a Brahmin would be so wise that he would love or she would love each soul on this earth. Now you are listening he and she because it is irrespective of your gender. Any soul can become a Brahmin. So a Brahmin loves each soul on this earth. Plain, irrespective of their bodily birth caste, bodily features, ethnicity, culture, religion. Brahmins are so soul conscious that they don't differentiate between gender and have equal respect for souls in a male or a female body. Why? Because they understand that as a soul, if you're listening to this knowledge right now, you might be a soul in a male body or you might be a soul in a female body. But in your previous birth or in the next birth, you could attain a male and opposite gender body. So the soul is the one who needs to be given respect. You're not giving respect to a male or a female. A Brahmin would see beyond the skin. That's why you are a Brahmin. If you are seeing just the skin, loving the skin, talking about the skin and talking about the desires and the needs for this body, then you become a Shudra, God says. So here comes the most important part, by the way. Brahma is shown sitting on a lotus. If you open the Google and you find out, practically it is not possible to take a human body and make it sit or load it onto a lotus flower. It is not practically possible. But what does it mean then? What it depicts is that just like other deities are shown sitting on a lotus as a symbol of purity of brahmacharya, celibacy and having a pure mind and a pure intellect. Even Brahma is pure and not just because of brahmacharya but this purity is the purity of the mind and intellect which means that a Brahman can never look down on any soul on this earth more so, a Brahman only chooses to see the best in others as a Brahman soul has the third eye of knowledge. Third eye means the soul. He has the or she has the knowledge of the soul and can see beyond the limitations of the cultures, religions, religious differences, caste, greed, ethnicity, language and much more. A Brahman if ever thinks about differentiation on the basis of language, caste, ethnicity or any of the above said worldwide differences, then this Brahman is no longer a Brahmin but a Shudra intellect soul. Even though that Brahmin has the knowledge of all the scriptures. Still, a Brahmin soul has the wisdom of soul consciousness to bring the whole world together when it stands divided. That is how powerful a Brahmin is. So he does not belong to any religion but he can bring or she can bring all the religions of the world with the power, with the knowledge of soul consciousness together. A Brahman soul has the wisdom to see other souls' qualities and good sanskars, that means habits, and can help that soul connect to the Supreme God who is an ocean of all the values, all the qualities and all the good sanskars or habits with the help of those qualities and sanskars or habits. So he will actually expand that Brahman will actually expand your intellect instead of narrowing it down on the basis of bodily differentiations. So the next question that comes to one's mind is that who is a Shudra? To explore this, we need to understand that the Supreme God creator of the Brahman clan through Brahma has said that any soul who has thoughts, words and actions, please listen to this carefully, any soul who has thoughts, words and actions which involve lust, anger, greed, ego, attachment, jealousy, hatred, competition, comparison and other viceful thinking is a Shudra intellect soul. No matter what menial job that soul does through its body, <clears throat> but a soul who has or is in the process of removing the above main five vices, lust, anger, greed, ego, attachment, with the help of Supreme Godhead and his purest spiritual knowledge is a true Brahman who is trying to overcome these impure thinkings of body consciousness. 
that soul could be born in a shudra family could be doing the menial work but if he has or she has the knowledge of brahma and the knowledge attained through brahma through the supreme godfather and is working towards removing these vices within him or her can become a brahman so then god says and his purest spiritual knowledge is a true brahman in simple words low quality of viceful thinking soul is a shudra a and a high and pure thinking or god like thinking and acting soul is a brahman soul as adam or brahma or adam is the first and the finest creation of god so to say to its epitome of purity in the eyes of god himself so are the mouth born souls of brahma who listen to this knowledge become brahmin supposed to be following his high level of conduct that means they are supposed to be brahmacharis following brahma's acharan or acharan means character of brahma that's how you become brahmachari not just somebody who's a celibate such souls who follow the footsteps of brahma are real brahmacharis since a brahman soul is the first of the creation of god through brahma such soul can never practice ill feeling or malice towards any soul of any other religion a brahman soul would have the practice of self control and would be able to rule over his or her own mind and intellect and not allow the five senses control his mind or intellect that is a true brahman if any sense out of the five senses of such a soul is distracted by vices then such a soul is no longer a brahman at that instance however a soul can fluctuate from a brahman to a shudra in a second depending upon the quality of thoughts as simple as that see it's so simple to understand who's a real brahman and who's a shudra so quality of thoughts a brahman soul is the root of the tree that holds all the religions of the world that means a brahman soul is a seed of the human world tree such a soul would not even practice in his thoughts the ego of thinking of one self to be the supreme knowledgeful than others now what about the other sects or clans see we have been talking about brahman but what about kshatriyas what about vaishyas for this supreme god head our creator has said that the first clan which is the knower of the knowledge of the creation and the creator god himself such a clan works hard towards bringing about light of this knowledge to the whole world and becomes the helpful arms of brahma that's why brahma has been shown with thousands and thousands of arms in certain cases such a clan is not just the preacher of knowledge they can just can't be preaching this knowledge to the mouth but they first act on that knowledge in their own life that means they show that they are true brahmins not just speak out the knowledge and be called as a brahmin and shows others how to be a true or a good human being or in other terms a brahmin is a good human being that's the definition of a brahmin a good human being then god says thus the saying goes <coughs> brahman so devtai nama or brahma so devtai nama that means meaning a brahman is equal in sanskars that means habits to a divine soul or a deity a brahman would have such high quality of thinking which is equivalent to a divine human being or a deity that is why in temples only a brahman is allowed to touch and feed and clean the idols of a deity because it is thought that a brahman could never think or have any low kind of thinking like a shudra so however as we have already discussed above that a sinful thinking soul can never be considered to be a brahman even though one may be born physically in a brahman family so you could have a lineage of brahmins in your family but if you got sinful thinking viceful thinking then as per god's dictates you are no longer a brahman in one second if you are thinking sinful thinking you become a shudra in one second if you think wiser pure intellectual thinking and good for everybody else then you become a brahman so the next clan after the brahman clan is the deity clan the missing clan which has not been mentioned 
This is the missing clan which has not been mentioned in any scriptures but only revealed to us by the Supreme Creator Himself. A Brahman soul who finally over one's lifetime wins over those five vices which we have talked about above becomes capable of becoming a deity in the next birth. That means if a Brahman soul or a Shudra soul who took this knowledge of the Brahman and God work towards it and won over the five vices becomes a Brahmin. So from a Shudra one can become a Brahmin and then take those habits and sanskars as a soul in the next birth and become a deity soul. So the deity clan is the one only a deity clan is one with only divine qualities and virtues. Such a clan can exist only in Satya Yuga on earth also known as the golden period or age or the true age Sat means true the next clan is the kshatriya clan the warrior clan as the name says it it's the warrior clan a clan of brahmins who are not able to overcome the vices completely that means you're a shudra and you were trying to become a brahmin and you're working hard but you're not able to 100 percent overcome lust anger greed ego attachment that means you were still fighting with those vices within your mind and the time came for you to leave your body that means that came along so you couldn't win over those five vices 100 percent so you become a kshatriya in the next birth as the name says it is the warrior clan a clan of brahmins who are not able to overcome the vices completely and are able to cleanse their soul lesser than 100 percent they fall into this kshatriya clan in other words they kept on fighting with lust anger greed ego and attachment even at the time death of their body came along such souls get to come onto the earth plane when golden age has finished and the silver age has begun obviously gold is more precious so that age is more precious and silver age is less precious age on earth so the next clan is the vashya clan or the merchant clan such a clan as the name suggests does business they think about business what can i get when i give something so here in spiritual terms a brahman soul who even after receiving all the godly spiritual knowledge imbibes certain qualities and virtues of a divine soul but now here's the catch does the smart business with the creator of clans of God now either he does a smart business or she does a smart business even with God of imbibing those qualities or virtues only if God gives this Brahmin some benefits or comforts in the present Brahmin life you see the deal which this Vashya soul is doing only then this Brahmin would adopt such values and virtues so he's done a deal of business deal with God too this soul falls into such a clan of Vashyas <clears throat> and doesn't get to enter the gates of golden or silver ages on earth here we would not confuse with Vaishnavas and Vashyas Vaishnavas as you must have heard about are those souls who follow purity not just in food you must have seen many Vaishna Vaishnav Dhabas or Vaishnav food outlets there they don't use garlic and onion they have pure food and they sometimes pray to Lord Vishnu and then offer the food most probably I hope so one of the reasons why deity Vishnu is showing sorry let's go ahead Vaishnavas are those souls who follow purity not just in food but also brahmacharya in their life like deity Vishnu. Now why are we saying like deity Vishnu? Because if you've seen the symbolism of Lord Vishnu lying down on to the five-headed snake or Sheshnag. So one of the reasons why deity Vishnu is shown resting over the five-headed snake is that the snake's five heads actually depict the five vices such as lust, anger, greed ego and attachment thus a true Vaishnav is one who has won over the five vices and is not just following pure food habits but has also won over the five vices now the Vaishya clan souls discerned on earth during the copper or Dwapar yuga. so we have understood the difference between Vaishnavs and Vaishyas when Satyug and Treta or the purest yugas have ended on earth that's the time they get to descend because they did a business deal with God. They were not so pure and they were not so clean in the heart. Why so? Because they were busy doing business deal with God for giving up vices whereas others were 
winning over the vices and becoming deities and kshatriyas. Now the obvious clan at the end is the Shudra clan. This clan comes after Dwapar Yuga, that is in the Kali Yuga. For this, ask yourself this question. All of you listeners who are listening to this on YouTube channel or on WhatsApp, ask yourself this question. Who on earth during this Kali Yuga is pure enough to call themselves a true Brahmin? Are you pure enough to call yourself a true Brahmin? Have you won over the vices of lust, anger, greed, ego, attachment? Or are you in the process of winning over these vices? In other words, is there any soul who is clean in thoughts, words and actions, thus free from lust, anger, ego, attachment and greed? So if you are born in a Brahmin family because of a physical birth, because of your lineage and have been studying the scriptures or can recite all the scriptures word to word, but still haven't overcome the ego of having such knowledge or have been thinking, talking and acting lustfully, have been greedy for name, fame and possessions, have been getting angry for small, menial or big issues in life every day, then would you consider yourself to be a true Brahmin or a Shudra? Ask yourself this question. We are going to finish in a bit. At the end of Kali Yuga, each and every soul is a Shudra in the eyes of God. Well, for us to call ourselves a Shudra or if any human being says that you are a Shudra, you are a low intellect, you are full of lust, anger, greed, ego, attachment, we might get angry, right? But when God tells us that you are a Shudra, my child, then we accept it. There is no other choice. So no matter whatever your job is to clean, is to clean either the gutters of the city or work as a sophisticated IT professional born in a Brahmin family, hope the message is clear that if your thinking is impure, you are still a Shudra. Hope the message is clear and is not to hurt anyone's sentiments. What I believe is that when deeper understanding of these pure concepts are understood, we will never get hurt. We shall stop differentiating human souls on the basis of caste and become true Brahmins or Adam's children, the eldest of all children who see each soul on the basis of their quality of thoughts purity of words and actions and not on the basis of their field of work or which caste were they born in on a physical bodily level. There is another age or the incognito age known as the confluence age or just like there is a there is an extra day after every four years in the month of Feb also known as the leap year. Here too after four ages now that is about just one year 12 months. 365 days. Here we are talking about thousands of years. Here too, after the four ages have passed, after thousands of years, namely Satyug, Golden Age, Treta Yug, Silver Age, Dwapar Yug, Copper Age, and the Kalyug, Present Age, Iron Age, there comes the extra time or extra hundred years. Now, leap year, one day we get extra. Here we are getting in thousands of years, 100 years extra before Kalyug is destroyed. Now, Brahma's age is also known as to be 100 years Brahma's age. So this is already 86 years have already passed and a couple of years, just 14 years are left of this age to finish. So this is also known as the Sangam Yug or Confluence Age. We are already in this Confluence Age or Sangam Yug, a transitioning Yug where we get to become true Brahmins from Shudra way of thinking, talking and acting. The Sangam Yuga is coming to a closure soon and this is the time to get to know the Creator and His secrets of creation directly from Him and become as pure as Him or like Father of Humanity, Father Brahma. Thus we qualified to be called true Brahmins again who become capable in the eyes of God, not human eyes, but in the eyes of God to enter the gates of Satyug as divine deities. It is now or never. With this, we come to an end to the effort of short description of the various clans and what is their spiritual essence. If you need any more assistance or clarification, you may contact me. And with this, Om Shanti to all of you. Happy listening.